and welcome to Track Safety Matters 3. This edition is focused on close calls and I'm standing here on the Royal Albert Bridge which spans the Tamar between Devon and Cornwall. A marvellous bridge built by Brunel 170 years ago and which we're now doing a major restoration on. And I've been here to meet some of the people working on this bridge and talk to them about how they are using close calls to make the work site safe. So Peter, when we had the induction, yes. you, you were talking to me about close call and how you use the close call system here in, uh, on, on this project. Right, Can yes. you tell me something about it, how, what a difference it's made? We, we do like to uh, keep a, a role in contact with, with close calls. We just don't let it issue a card and issue a briefing and let it go. We like to monitor them, keep them coming and, and obviously go out on the bridge and look for them yourself. And it's of course really important that, that people who submit a close call then get feedback on yes. it. So close, you, yeah, close, you, you, close you, it you out. Close them out. Yeah, close it out. Uh, demonstrate to them that they've, they've, they've spotted a close call. It yeah. could have been a potential accident and or incident. Close it out, rectify it, tell the boys that uh, whoever reported it, and that's it, job done. It, initially, when they first started, there was probably uh, an error of thought between the lads that, ooh, I'm not reporting that. I'm not reporting, I'll get, you know, I'll be a, a trouble cause, etc. But that's disappeared. It's going and it's, it's working well. Well, that's fantastic to hear, Peter, and uh, I really want to congratulate you and the team for doing such an amazing job here on this very challenging project. Which has been a challenge. I <laughs> guarantee it's been but, a challenge. Uh, but I'm also proud of the safety record you've had on this job, yeah. and, and I'm really pleased that you've got a culture where close call and intervention is just a, a natural part of the way you work. It so, is. Well, well done. Prevention is better than any cure, isn't it? That's exactly right. It's really great to be back at a site such as this. That I was first here two years ago when the, when the site was really starting and actually understand how the safety journey of a, of a project such as this with a community of, of workforce who've been on the job for over the last couple of years working closely together, how they've embedded behavioural safety and the way that they've adopted in their work practices. They get together on a regular basis, they talk about safety and you can really see how it translates out into the work site, how they really are working together to look after each other. We often want, you know, say, what is a close call? Well, a close call can be a lot of things. And if you thought to yourself, hey, that could have hurt someone, or, oh, we nearly had an accident there, that's a close call. It can be something fairly major on, on a track renewal site, and we always think of ballast and rails and the heavy side of it. But it could be in an office, it could be a loose carpet. You know, a lot of our injuries and accidents are slips, trips and falls, and so often they can be overlooked because it's just a little thing. Well, one of the key things that, that we promote within our close call reporting policy is that it's not just the reporting that counts, although that's important. One of the, one of the really significant um, benefits of close call reporting is the action that's taken by the individual when they first see the hazard. It's If they can safely um, address the hazard that they've identified, then that's the thing that we would want people to do first, because in doing that, that actually then removes the hazard and, and, and really prevents then the likelihood of, a, um, of an accident or an incident occurring. Actually then going on to report the close call formally allows us to then record it in our system and then we can use that information to identify whether that's a single occurrence or whether there is a trend developing. Because this isn't just about reporting for the sake of it, this is about safety improvements. And we get safety improvements by following up our close calls, finding out what action was taken, and, and learning lessons as well. Sometimes people have actually taken the action themselves, and it's good to feedback and to acknowledge that as well and where, where it's appropriate. The message we give is, is close calls are accidents that almost happened, so our understanding of close calls will really drive safety improvements so those accidents aren't realised and they don't happen. We really do emphasise that part of our lifeguard scheme is that they have every bit as much responsibility for their safety and their, the safety of their colleagues as it is mine and, and the site management. So uh, that, that's slowly gaining momentum now and, and indeed we, we get quite a healthy number of returns, typically two or three per man per week uh, submitted. Um, and obviously over the, over the course of the month we, we, we're in the thousands uh, from which you know we get a variety of suggestions, be it from safety to welfare. Uh, so they're all given a, a, a positive review by the management. 
I think that the general impression with track workers is that they, they, they're frightened to raise close calls. They're afraid that they might be causing trouble or they're, they're afraid that they'll get somebody else into trouble. Um, that there still is, is that fear uh, within the subcontract community that if they raise CF safety issues, um, they won't be asked back. That's certainly not the case, but that's the perception we need to change. There's quite a lot of people in the gangs at ground level feel that it's, it's, it's kind of like telling tales and they don't want to be seen to be doing this and the industry as a whole has a big challenge going forward to make this uh, more of a common practice and, and not felt like that they're telling tales on people. One of the really hard things about intervention is this sense sometimes that you can be sort of grassing on your mates or you know you, it's embarrassing sometimes to intervene or you know it's, it's you know we've always done it that way and that's just kind of the way things are around here and what I really want to encourage people to to sort of is, is to be a part of a culture where it's just an instinct it's a natural instinct to intervene if you see something that's wrong you know there, there, sometimes it's just something that we can all pull together and just fix there and then. Sometimes those things that are wrong are more serious and we need to really understand why it was that people were doing the things that they were doing in that way. And that's why we've introduced the fair culture process to make sure that we have a proper way of looking at why people do things. This is not about just attributing blame straight away and saying it's your fault mate, you know, you've done the wrong thing. This is about trying to understand why people do the things they do and sort out the root causes. So a fair culture is about trying to improve the overall safety culture of our business in the best possible way. Because I fundamentally believe that people come to work to do a good job. And if they're not doing a good job, then we need to understand why and help them to improve uh, the environment in which they work. People don't make mistakes on purpose, they don't do things, but if it gets identified and it then can be perhaps briefed out, a change of working, something that I think is, is key for people not to feel threatened to ring in a close call. Like, say for example, an excavation um, machine is digging a hole, um, but there's not adequate um, barrier around the site, will stop the job, um, get sufficient barrier around it, and um, then continue on from there. There's just uh, small examples like that. I walked onto the track and tested with um, the live line testers, and it gave a um, positive reading to indicate the um, Conrail was still live. So immediately moved to a position of safety, and then contacted the engineering supervisor and advised him of the close call. Well, it's good to see that the lads are actually following the procedures, what they're trained to do and everything. They're following the life-saving rules to start with, your test before you touch. So it just goes to show that, you know, that they do go out there and they do follow these procedures and, and, and doing their job correctly. I mean, I've done numerous close calls myself. Quite often on work sites, if there's somebody not wearing protective eyewear, we will ask them to uh, wear their eyewear, but also put it in as a close call because it's something that then can be looked at in the future as to why people aren't wearing them on a regular basis. Overall, whether insignificant or significant, everything should be reported because I feel that in doing so, I could help somebody go home at the end of the day, uh, whereas if it's left, somebody could get hurt or I could get hurt. The future for close calls is looking at how we can improve it, but we want to get a stakeholder's engagement. We want to talk to people out there, the people making the close calls, the people receiving the close calls and the people managing them. We want to look at trending, we want to look at analysing all the information and we want people to come forward and feel comfortable in making these close calls. But also looking at, is this something that I can do? And I just want to share with you why it's, this is so important for me personally. Uh, and unfortunately, it's a, it's a tragic accident. Um, in 2000, the year 2000, I was running a, a business in the North Sea. Um, I can't tell you today what the production level was. I can't tell you how much my budget was. I can't tell you how many people I had working for me. I can't remember even what my team was. But I know exactly what happened on January the 3rd, 2000. 
when a, a young man, 32 years old, was killed on one of our drilling rigs. And he was killed when a piece of 13-inch diameter pipe was being lifted from uh, one location to another. And the pipe was incorrectly slung. And as it was lifted, it caught on something, the pipe slipped and fell, bounced on the deck, hit Chris in the, in the, in the chest and killed him. He died 45 minutes later on a hel helicopter going back to, uh, back to the base. The really tragic thing about that fatality and Chris's death was that five different people had actually observed him slinging the pipe in the wrong way. And not one of them had said, Oi, Chris, mate, sling it properly, mate. They hadn't done it. And the really tragic thing is that we didn't have a culture within that organization at that time where that kind of instinctive intervention was expected. And that's the culture we have to have. Don't be embarrassed if you see something that you think is not right. See it as your duty, your obligation to intervene to help somebody because you can save a life, not just in that particular instance, but in helping us to create an overall culture within the organization where instinctive intervention and close call is just a part of the way we are, continuously improving and striving to make our workplace safer for everyone.